you down? <laughs> okay. Um, Kurt, you're going to go first? Okay. So I'm going to introduce Kurt Berger. He's the assistant director of the um, Glen Ellen Historical Society, Stacey's Cavern Museum. And since 1967, the, the society here, their mission has been to research, collect, preserve, and, preserve, uh, and present the history of Glen Ellen. And I know it was challenging. You had a flood and there's been a lot of work to get things back up, but it's a great space. We're excited to be here. Uh, Mark earned his in history from Elmhurst University, minored in fine arts, while serving as a, a fellow from Elmhurst, his research centered on collecting data which define museums' best practices and applications. Over the last few years, he's been working to aid in the historical society's knowledge of Glen Ellen's 187 year post settlement history. He's uncovering and shining the light on Glen Ellen's Native American history as well, which is something we're interested in. So I'm, I welcome you. Thank you so much for being here. Here, let me take your notes. <laughs> So good evening. Um, I want to thank you all for coming. It's, it's nice to be all of you out here and I can see faces at least when the nose up. Um, I also want to thank those at, on the Zoom channel um, for having us at your home. We truly appreciate that. And as we mentioned earlier, my name is Kirk Berger, the assistant here at the Island Historical Society. Um, if you happen to have attended the College of DuPage Native Advocacy Roundtable last March, you'll be a little bit familiar with the topic that I'll be covering tonight. Tonight, I'll be giving a summary of the Native American historical presence in what we know of today as Glen Ellen. I'll be speaking mostly of the local Potawatomi peoples of the 19th century. More specifically, I'll be addressing the large Potawatomi village that was once located in what we know of today as Church of the Woods Forest Preserves. So out of personal curiosity, um, how many of you, raise your hands, knew that there was a, a large Potawatomi village at Church of the Woods? Quite a few. All right, keep your hands up if you know a lot about Potawatomi peoples. Yeah, okay, so. Two people online raised their hands. If you did, good. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, in either case, I hope my presentation tonight adds to your knowledge and appreciation of just how special a place Churchill Woods Forest Reserve really is. So um, with that, let's get started, okay? The Potawatomi were the predominant population in Glen Ellen at the time of the arrival of the settlers in 1834. It's thanks to these settlers, we have a written historical description of their interaction with the area's Potawatomi inhabitants. Keep in mind, these descriptions were exclusively written by the white settlers, and we have no account of the Potawatomi's perspective of these same interactions. But before we get too far into my discussion of Glen Ellen's Potawatomi, I should note, we know there were other indigenous peoples in this area prior to the Potawatomi. Unfortunately, we have no record or direct evidence of their had, having had any permanent settlements within Glen Ellen. But there is plenty of physical evidence found not far from here to suggest that they may have. Archaeological surveys conducted just southwest of here in 1970 at the National Accelerator, Accelerator Laboratory, I always trip over that, in uh, Batavia, unearthed 17 Native American sites. Some of these artifacts found at these sites dated back to the archaic period or roughly to 6,500 BC. Put this into perspective, this is about 3,000 years before the great pyramids at Giza were built. During the archaic period, indigenous people became less nomadic than their Paleo-Indian ancestors. They were more sedentary and settled into seasonal villages following food source availability. It's also at this time we see the beginnings of long distance trade networks. Keep in mind, people traveled everywhere by foot. The horse would not be introduced to mainland North America, the, the continent, for over 8,000 years. The archaic Native uh, Americans led a hunting and gathering way of life, not unlike the Paleo Indians, but a newly developed tool made the hunting more efficient. The Atlatl was a grooved wooden handle from three to six foot long. A piece of bone or antler formed a hook at one end of the handle. The hunter would lay the spear on the handle, its blunt end against the Edlatl's hook. The hunter threw the spear by snapping his wrist at the end of the throw, propelling the spear forward off the handle. The Edlatl increased the speed, distance, and force of the impact to the spear throw. During the archaic period, we also see the beginnings of the making and use of pottery. 
Meals were prepared by boiling water in watertight skins. Uh, red hot rocks were dropped into these baskets of skin, bringing the water to a quick boil. Foods were also cooked over open fires in a roasting place. In 1931, and again in 1975, archaeological digs were made in West Chicago, less than six miles west of here, along the West Branch of the DuPage River. These digs conducted by the University of Chicago and Wheaton College at the Winfield burial mounds and nearby village site found evidence of people having lived there for a period over 1,300 years. The better known of these sites, the Winfield Mounds, dates back to around 300 BC or the early woodland period. This period is identified with mound building and the establishment of trade extending across large areas of North America. The early woodland peoples moved in small groups to take advantage of seasonally available resources, such as nuts, fish, shellfish, and wild plants. They didn't only rely on wild plants, but they also domesticated plants for food as well. By early woodland period, the use of pottery became more plentiful and widespread than it had been previously. Upriver, about a mile from the Winfield's uh, mounds, is the Couch Billet site. This was inhabited at least six different times from the Archaic period to the late woodland periods from 4000 BC to 1000 AD. Populations had increased during the late woodland period and settlements spread upriver and streams filling the landscape. People continued to live in base camps, but the increase in population and greater proximity of campsites to one another led to competition for resources. This, of course, led to an increase of territorial warfare. As a result, trade and interregional exchange lessened. The late woodland period was also a time of important cultural and technological changes such as the appearance of the bow and arrow. In the past, previously, hunting had been a community activity. Groups of hunters acted in unison to take down large game. The bow and arrow allowed an individual hunter to be more self-sufficient. Though they still hunted for game and gathered nuts and other woodstuffs, they were no longer as greatly dependent on hunting and gathering. The late woodland peoples were adept at attending plots of maize, squash, and other domestic food plants. So we know DuPage County had been occupied by indigenous peoples for at least 8,000 years before the worst white settlers moved here in 1834. However, in other parts of Illinois, indigenous sites, promises of various cash payments, tracts of land west of the Mississippi River, near Kansas, like we spoke about earlier. By contract, they were to have removed themselves and re relocated west of the Mississippi by 1835. In 1838, Potawatomi were forcibly removed out of Indiana, Wisconsin, and Michigan, and were resettled in Kansas Territory. Yet it's clear, as late as 1845, the Potawatomi still had a presence in our area. Was there a still permanent village in Churchill Woods? Probably not. But without a doubt, large bands of Potawatomi did still travel through here. They would also stay for extended periods of time. They did this up until about a decade before the Civil War. Any culture that has inhabited a place as small as Glen Ellen for at least 150 years has to leave its mark. That east-west trail that ran alongside Glen Ellen's Potawatomi village I spoke about earlier has been widened into a four-lane street we now call St. Charles Road. It isn't the only Potawatomi path we still use today. Parts of Ryford Road, Crescent Boulevard, and Swift Road are still well-traveled, and they were traveled long before the Churchill family arrived. In fact, if you follow the original path of, of St. Charles Road, it leads you directly to that late woodland period couch site I spoke about earlier, which predates 1000 AD. Here's another neat story. Up until 1918, Wayne Street extended eastward from downtown only as far as Taylor Street. Past that point, there was a dirt road named Cherry Lane. In 1919, it was decided to dig up Cherry Lane and extend Wayne eastward. There was a very odd looking tree on the north side of Cherry Lane, about 50 feet past Taylor. It grew up about three feet before it bent over toward Cherry Lane and then went up uh, five feet past that bend. It went straight sharply back up toward the sky. It was very odd looking. Anyway, as the road crew got there, um, right by the tree, they came across skeletal remains of a Potawatomi burial. The tree, which was still there up until it was taken down in 2020, is a Native American marker tree. Native Americans have left them all throughout North 
America. In fact, we have writings from early Glen Ellen historian, Ada Harmon, who lived from 1860 to 1943, about a marker tree that was cut down near her home here in Glen Ellen. The Native Americans would break the tree in this manner, so it would act as a road sign of sorts. It's very possible there are other marker trees still in Glen Ellen in someone's backyard somewhere. If you see one, please let the Glen Ellen Historical Society know. But my point being that many of the marks of the Potawatomi made on this land are still here. We just have to know what to look for. Arrowheads and other Potawatomi artifacts have been reportedly dug up in Glen Ellen for decades. Just last summer, John Fritz of the Glen Ellen Historical Society found a stone scraping tool in Churchill Woods itself. I have little doubt there are still many undiscovered Potawatomi artifacts out there. The Glen Ellen Historical Society is currently working to emphasize and expand our understanding of our town's native history. If you see a marker tree, please let the Glen Ellen Historical Society know if you find any native artifact pieces of pottery or arrowheads, for example, we'd love to put them on display and the enjoyment of the education of our community. Lastly, I'd like to leave you with this. Many may have been asking why all this is so important. You may have noticed road signs when driving into Glen Ellen today, which note our town is having been established in 1834, meaning people first settled here 187 years ago. This is grossly inaccurate. It reflects a very Eurocentric viewpoint. As I noted tonight, we know for a fact that large numbers of Potawatomi had settled a large village here over 350 years ago. Take that into account, these signs are only off by about 163 years. I think that's a difference. I want to be clear about what I'm saying next. It's merely conjecture on my part, and one with no real solid evidence supporting it. I believe the village site in Churchill Woods predates the Potawatomi by several hundred years. This is only a romantic notion of mine? No. Well, maybe partially. But there is reasoning for it, so hear me out. As I mentioned earlier, the path that became St. Charles Road leads directly to the Cow site, village site, six, like six miles west of here. Rather, I should say, the path by the Cow site leads directly to Churchill Woods. Remember, the last village at the Cow site was abandoned around 1000 AD. Potawatomi didn't arrive at Churchill Woods until over 650 years later, probably around the 1670s. Why would the Potawatomi create a path to a village site that had disappeared seven to eight generations earlier? There was nothing there for the Potawatomi to have found or arrived at. So the answer is, they wouldn't. But then if we flip the question around and we ask, why would the Count's people build a path to Churchill Woods? Ah, now here's a possible answer. One of the discoveries noticed at the Couch site was that it lacked any nearby source of church. Furthermore, there wasn't any sizable deposits of chert within five miles of the village. Why is that important? Chert is the raw material used to make arrowheads and stone tools. Remember, we noted earlier there were no horses in 1000 AD. This means every village needed to have everything it needed within a day's walking distance. Five miles out, five miles back, adds 10 miles, or about the distance one could cover and gather material and get back before nightfall. So, the couch village would have no way to import its chert from outside from elsewhere. So, take a guess where the nearest available chert field is located. Anyone have a guess? Yeah, that's right, Churchill Woods. Okay, it's intriguing, right? Okay, so let's take this to another step. If you lived at the couch site and knew it was lacking a necessary resource that you needed to survive, but you knew that the Churchill Woods site had all the resources that you needed. Why would you just pick up stakes and move to Churchill Woods? My theory is because there are already people living there. Why create a path to make a long two day walk to get the church you needed, then turn around and carry all that snow all the way back? Doesn't make sense unless you couldn't move to Churchill Cow site because of those people being there. So, my theory is that the path goes the other way, and this way, and that there was trade. But again, 1000 AD. So what does that mean? My hypothesis is there was already a people here, there were people there, and they were trading church and other things. It was a highway, just like we would do today. Here's some other exciting news for you. 
Because the problem is, I don't have any proof of what I just told you. We have no evidence. There's never been an archaeological dig done at the Churchill site. And we don't have any records going back before 1834. But a few months ago, members of the Glen Ellen Historical Society met with the Page County Forest Reserve Commissioner Jeff Garris, who you may know, and representatives of the Churchill Woods Forest Reserve. And mostly, importantly, the archaeologists from the Illinois State Archaeological Survey team to inspect the site where we discovered the part of Wadley artifact. At this meeting, we discovered the future construction of a bike path cutting through Churchill Woods to connect the Prairie Path with Great Western Trail. And here's the kicker. By law, an archaeological survey would have to be completed prior to the path's construction. So it's possible an archaeological dig just might be coming. That would be special. If evidence of an earlier village is found, we have a lot of welcome signs here in Glen Ellen to change. <laughs> so tonight I've been speaking about Glen Ellen's Potawatomi in historical terms. It's what I do. I'm a historian. But it's, it's very important to MA in Historical Administration from Northern Illinois University. He started his museum career as an intern at the Hoosier Grove Schoolhouse Museum. He worked at many other local museums, becoming executive director of the Glen Ellen Historical Society after volunteering for many years with the Forest Preserve District. Um, after volunteering for many, many years with the Forest Preserve, he then joined the staff as a naturalist at Klein Creek Farm, and that was in 1998. So, Keith, I was a docent there just before then with my two kids. I don't know that we overlap. <laughs> okay, and so now we're going to record you and your talk. Thank you so much, Keith. Well, thank you so much. Uh, as, as we've been talking about for decades, people People, uh, curious people, have been searching the ground for interesting uh, things and often picking them up and, and taking them home. And these are well meaning people. And the searching continues today. And as a heritage experience manager for the Forest Preserve, I'm often called when someone reports their findings. And so I came here today to talk a little bit about uh, the laws and considerations uh, to think about if you do find something that you think is culturally significant. So two years ago, I talked with a man who said he had found some mastodon bones. Um, he wanted the Forest Preserve to do an archaeological dig to find the rest of the mastodon. So I met with the man and I collected the objects he found, and we walked to the two forest preserves that he had been searching. Uh, he wasn't sure exactly where he had found them, uh, but I took him over to Wheaton College to the geological professor who cares for the Perry mastodon and to have the objects that One was uh, a stone uh, formed when calcium silt filled an ancient tube or hole, and then was formed into stone over time and pressure. Uh, no less interesting, but it was not a mastodon. And without knowing the exact location where it came from, it would be quite expensive to explore further. So I, I met with the man again, and I explained uh, the laws and considerations about uh, taking things from public land. And I asked him not to take things anymore. Uh, and he asked me if he could get a schedule for when the forest preserve would burn, because it's easier to find things when the vegetation is gone. So <laughs> my message did not get across. So what do you do if you find something that you think is significant? Uh, in Illinois, if you're on public land, that's schools, uh, government buildings, parks, forests, playgrounds, uh, all the things found in the ground are, are property of the state of Illinois. It must be curated by uh, the Illinois Museum. So, brought some show and tell. This is a little bottle. This is a Kickapoo uh, Indian cough cure. Had nothing to do with Kickapoo at all. Uh, this bottle was found on public land while the building was being destroyed. Right, it's broken down. Uh, the contractor doing the work wanted to keep the bottle. He 
because in their contract it said they could salvage from the building. But since the bottle was found under the ground, state law uh, took over and the bottle became property of the state of Illinois. So we have a discussion about property ownership. Uh, so you can see these, uh, these, these things are found everywhere. So the Illinois State Archaeological Survey, mentioned ISAS, uh, recommends if you find something on public land to take a picture of it and record where you found it in conjunction with uh, a large stone or tree or something that'll be easy to find. Uh, send those pictures to the governing agency for that land or directly to ISAS. Uh, they'll review the pictures and determine if more uh, investigation is appropriate. Now they've identified over 600 archaeological or potential archaeological sites in DuPage County. So you can imagine there's not resources to examine every single one of them. Uh, so it may be that the object that you found, there may not be any further study. That's on their analysis. Now, just a few months ago, I was contacted. A preserve user at the Blackwell Forest Preserve found a stone they thought was. Uh, oh, it's me. At the lake? Oh, at the lake. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I'm talking about the, so the big rock. It the big like rock. It was carved out. You did the perfect thing. You took a picture. <laughs> you told uh, Forest Preserve officials where it was. Uh, so they sent me the picture, and I uh, contacted uh, Lauren Fitz. Uh, at ISIS, ISAS, and we talked about the stone. So, uh, as we talked about the history of Blackwell, which the site used to be a stone quarry, uh, which was developed into a forest preserve, including a landfill that's now used as a sledding hill. Uh, we realized that even if the object was significant, it had been removed from its context. Uh, and so it uh, really wasn't something they were able to follow up on. Um, objects can only teach us so much. It's the connection with all of the other things around that's where we learn most about the text. So objects removed from their context diminishes um, the, the, what we can learn from that site. And there's a trend in archaeology to be less invasive. Because over time, our tools and our techniques improve. So we may be able to learn more if we wait to investigate in the future. So Kirk mentioned the Winfield Mounds. So the Winfield Mounds have been uh, greatly disturbed from the 1930s to the 1970s. Even before that, with uh, people just digging holes. There's very little chance that we can learn much more from that from the mound site or the village site. That's they're just too too disturbed. So if you find an object on private land, like in your yard, uh, ISAS recommends you do the same thing: take a picture, send it to them, uh, and then they can see if they uh, want to investigate further. Uh, but the laws are different, and those items are not as well protected. But sometimes it can be confusing uh, because there are other laws governing those objects. So we have the Historic Preservation Act, and we have the American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, uh, along with some local laws. So if you do find something, it's important to contact ISAS or an authoritative museum to get some guidance if you want um, us to learn from, from that object or what it could be connected to. So in November of 1990, uh, the federal government uh, passed the uh, Native American Grave Protection and Repatriation Act, or it's called NAGPRA, for short. And the law works to protect protect human remains, uh, funerary objects, sacred objects, and objects of 
cultural patrimony. And return those objects to the descendants of those peoples for the proper care. Uh, as Kurt mentioned, uh, federal laws were often brutal and oppressive, and the descendants of the people that lived here do not want us displaying the bones of their ancestors. That laws to protect that and to return those to the rightful place. In the 1990s, the Forest Preserve uh, did an extensive search of all of the artifacts that we hold to make sure we were complying with NAGPRA. And anything found at Churchill Woods, of course, would also fall under the NAGPRA law. So we should also consider the descendants of the people uh, that made these objects. And if you find something you believe was left behind by the Potawatomi, um, you can contact, I'm gonna put a name since no one uh, wrote down any names of the Potawatomi, uh, Kelly Moss Teller or other staff of the Citizens of Potawatomi Nation a Cultural Heritage Center in Shawnee, Oklahoma. They have a, a form Know about the object and the review process to see if it's something that they would like to add to their collection. There are also many other resources um, for the many tribes that have lived in this area. Uh, so the Forest Preserve District uh, has a climate controlled collections area at the Maze Lake Peabody Stake. Uh, where we store objects that are used at the Pine Creek Farm, where I started. St. James Farm, Maze Lake Peabody Estate, Fullersburg Woods, Willowbrook Wildlife Center, um, along with other programs. In fact, the Mastodon Tooth just went out on Monday for a public lecture. And we store things like uh, 10,000 year old pine cone, the Mastodon Teeth that I mentioned. Lots of cicadas, furniture, tools, books, uh, and a collection of natural history objects. We also hold a large collection of uh, things found during archaeological digs. And I have some things here I'll, I'll leave out on the table, but uh, just to show you, we have some obsidian. And I don't know if you found any obsidian deposits. Or, <laughs> so uh, this may have come from a long way away, but it was found in a forest preserve. We have some shirt uh, along with some more recent objects. All of these were found uh, because of archaeological digs that were done before the Forest Preserve uh, built buildings. So, like you said, if the Forest Preserve is going to uh, make a trail or a building, uh, if anything significant is found, they bring in uh, an agency like ISAS, a shovel test find something significant, uh, they may do further exploration. Uh, the forest preserve may also choose to move the path so that it doesn't disturb uh, the cultural sites. Uh, these objects were all collected in the 70s and 80s, and we hired an archaeologist to uh, go through them and prepare them to send to the state because of all state property. 90s. Uh, at the time, the state was having funding issues and said, please hold on to them. Uh, so things have changed. And we've connected up with ISAS, and so we're working together uh, so that the state can curate the collection and decide where it's best to be kept. Now, if you have objects, Native American objects that you'd like to care for, or if you have personal objects uh, that you want, to preserve from your family or, or antiques, I have a couple of tips. Uh, first is any drastic change in moisture uh, can be very damaging. If you take something from the ground and you put it in a dry environment like our house, uh, if it's made of different types of materials, the materials will dry at different rates uh, and damage can happen just as it dries out. Uh, also dirt 
on the object it can also drive different rates and can also do some damage. So if you want to preserve things, I would recommend consulting a conservator who specializes in the objects that you need to care for. And that can include even you know, a family Bible or a wedding album that gets wet. There are different ways of better ways to dry those objects out. Professional mechanical company for that. Um, changes in temperature and humidity. Temperature and humidity work together. You know, warmer holds more moisture, it gets colder, it lets moisture out. Uh, it can also damage objects. If you've ever seen uh, an old piece of furniture that has the alligator finish, uh, that comes from a change in temperature and humidity. Uh, the wood and the finish on top of it are changing at different rates giving it that finish, a more stable environments uh, are better for, for things. Light can also be a problem. And I found this, this is uh, a poster made from a painting from Frank Champion Murphy, Glenelg resident, uh, and you can see it is suffering from some fading because of UV light, even though this has a UV filter. So things on continual display uh, can't suffer the fading, even if it's protected. <clears throat> well, I don't know, did anyone know Frank Murphy? <laughs> he was a uh, he was an artist and he was hired by the Angus Association because photography did not work very well on black cows. So for years, mm -hmm. all of the advertisements were paintings. Mm -hmm. kind of this was his uh, annual association poster, and he was playing with the This is backdrop. Mm -hmm. Cool. Uh, dust can bring mold, mildews, and grit abrasives. Mold and mildew can discolor things. They can also eat away at materials, and they can attract insects to eat the mold. Uh, dust can, can leave scratches. So recommended to, to dust things on a regular basis. Insects can do damage by eating materials or making nest out of the materials, mice and rodents, other animals can do the same thing on a larger scale. Now, believe it or not, the most danger to an artifact comes from people. Uh, we have to balance our curiosity, and our desire to, to learn from things, and to display things, uh, with uh, our desire for these things to last. As a young man working in a copy shop, and handed me a letter um, to get a copy. And I noticed the signature was a Lincoln. Oh. So I decided it was best that fewer people handle this object. So I brought the man behind the counter to show him how to use a copy machine and, and, and make this copy. Uh, when he put it back in the protective sleeve, he told me that he had just paid twelve hundred dollars for this and he wanted copy to display so you could keep people safe. Wonderful. Uh, so like I said, I have a uh, little sampling of objects found in many of the archaeological digs throughout the county on Forest Reserve land. I'm happy to put out and take a look. And I know that we will answer any questions that you Yeah, if anyone wants to see this, so if, um, what I saw on the Forest Preserve property was a, a rock that looked like it was a grinding, you know, a grinding source. So it was right on the shore. I was kayaking and I thought, <laughs> so thank you guys so very much. Um, I don't know if we have the ability to answer questions from Zoom land.
Yeah, if, uh, feel free to enter a question in the chat and I can read it and off. In the meantime, yeah. Okay, if anybody has a question here that you wanted to ask about, uh, they were very inclusive explanations. So we really appreciated your program. Yes. I'm curious about whether there are any descendants of the Potawatomi people who are still living in DuPage County that we know of. I'm going to repeat it just because I don't, I know yeah. you're nice and loud for all of us, but I don't know mm -hmm. if that's a good, so people can hear it on the microphone. The question was if there's any descendants of the Potawatomi people living here in DuPage County now. Um, the answer to that is we really don't know for various reasons. Um, Do one, you guys want to stand up oh, here? Sure. Because it might, be good. it might work yeah. with the microphone better. And I'll, I'll step aside. And maybe if they ask a question, you guys can repeat it. I don't need to do that. <laughs> Um, the answer to your question, are there Potawatomi's uh, descendants still living in Glen Allen? The answer is we really don't know. Um, you have to remember at some point, they either voluntarily or forcibly moved from the area uh, to the Prairie State, uh, I'm sorry, the Prairie Indians, we already spoke in this feature that Potawatomi had two distinct styles of living. Those in Indiana and Michigan consider themselves woodland Indians. That's what they call themselves because they live more of a uh, agricultural lifestyle and more sedentary. Um, whereas out here, throughout northern Illinois, uh, northeastern Illinois, and in Wisconsin, they consider themselves prairie Indians. They were hunter gatherers primarily. Um, the, the prairie Indians were moved to Kansas, whereas the others went up to Oklahoma. Uh, and that's even in the list. Secondly, one of the things we discussed at the, the College of the Page Native American Roundtable was those that stayed here either intermarried or would not express the fact that they were Native American, they would pass themselves off as Spanish uh, or some other nationality. Um, for a long time, uh, there were perfect examples actually spoken up that night of people living up to today knew they were of Native American breeding or background and never lived that lifestyle and were told to keep it quiet. So it was a, it was a shameful thing and it's kept quiet. So the answer to that is that's what we don't know. So yes. I can, I can add a little bit before sure. we move on. So the Citizens Potawatomi Nation, which uh, was mainly formed from the Indiana who does have its own constitution and uh, they have citizen records. Uh, they also have records of allotments for the land that individuals were given in territory as those territories became states. So there are records. Uh, and again, the, the cultural center in Oklahoma probably has quite a bit of information, but I don't know if it will good. Yes. When you were describing the 1834 Potawatomi, and you said they were referred to as the people, did that mean that they didn't have any interaction with white people? There was no trading going on? There was nothing? No, not at all. Uh, the question was, were the Potawatomi, I'm paraphrasing, and the European settlers, did they keep separate culture? Did they keep apart from each other? They did not. Um, there are records basically, if you go down to Naperville, the blacksmiths were carrying rifles for, uh, or any other kind of metal objects for the, the Potawatomi, the Fox, et cetera, that there was this interchange of business. Um, we have to know an Alanite said with hunting, that they learned from stuff back and forth. Um, the Churchill cabin I just spoke about, the Native Americans would come out and hang outside the door. Uh, there was that interaction with them. There wasn't, uh, it was peaceful, it was neighborly. Doesn't mean they, they always equated each other as being equals. Um, but in, in Glen Allen in particular, in our records, we have no name of one Potawatomi that lived here. I have plenty of names of the settlers that have been here, almost every one of them. Mm -hmm. But uh, there's no record of an actual name. There are some throughout the rest of Illinois and throughout the rest of the county, there are records of actual names, but not here. So I hope that answers yeah. your question. There's uh, two questions in the chat. We we'll just throw these in sure. the mix here. One is, uh, were I'll any? I'll just throw. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. I just want to throw in, and 
I may not have all this right because it's been a long time since I worked here, but I believe in the older part of Forest Hill Cemetery, they will no longer dig grave sites because they kept running into unmarked graves and they have a suspicion that those mm -hmm. unmarked graves were uh, Native American living in the very old cemetery. So um, that, that interaction mm -hmm. happened as well. All right, thanks. So, Sorry, you were saying. First question is, uh, were any artifacts found with the perimastodon that was excavated so many years ago? Uh, and then the second question is, are there any active archaeological digs now in DuPage County? So the yeah. perimastodon was excavated by Wheaton College uh, when Judge mm -hmm. Perry wanted to uh, build a, a lake in his backyard. Uh, the workmen came across, I believe, the skull first. They identified this, and so Judge Perry uh, called Wheaton College and gave them a number of days to get these parts. Uh, they literally were running. Uh, they would excavate something, wrap it in plaster, and run into trucks so that they could get as much as they could as quickly as they could. They did not have time to, mm -hmm. to discover any other uh, artifacts in association with that. Now, that being said, uh, I talked with the professor that took care of it. He hasn't told me anything about any other artifacts, but it, there could be, but I, I doubt it. They, mm -hmm. they work very hard and very quickly uh, to get the pieces that they need. And what's the other question? Well, are there any active digs going on now in DuPage County? Uh, no. Uh, okay. Well, the, the last, well, no active digs. There was a shovel test done, mm -hmm. uh, I believe in Warrenville as, as the Forest Reserve was planning a trail. Uh, they did discover a potential site. And so the Forest Reserve rerouted the trail to avoid damaging any culture heritage there. But I don't believe there's anything active right now. Mm -hmm. uh, and you had said that there, uh, that correct that uh, the Churchill Woods village had never has never been excavated as an archaeological site. Not to my knowledge. There's never been an official one. Someone's been over there with a shovel, but we don't know. But uh, no, at this point there is not. So everything we know is from uh, the historical record. Correct. Correct. Um, which is why I said you know, the hypothesis that I made is merely hypothesis without evidence. We don't have a written record prior to 1834. Um, so that being said, these rivers, the east and west branch have been traveled for centuries. We obviously we have record that it was, our actual archeological evidence that it was. As Keith had mentioned, uh, many of those have been plundered throughout the decades prior to our even knowing that they were there. So much of what we could have found out about it is missing. We don't even know, for instance, um, the mounds uh, that we were talking about earlier in Warrenville. Um, I believe there were remains found in one, but we're not certain if the mounds were there um, as burial mounds or if they're just effigy mounds because there's really nothing left. The problem is, um, when the mounds were built, normally what they would do is they would take a body after you, you passed away, and they would perch it somewhere, a tree, a platform, something along those, lines, and let it decay. They would gather up the remains into a bag and then bury them. So um, it's not exactly the best way to preserve remains. Uh, it's been suggested oftentimes that some of these bags will be open with dust, or the dust might offend somebody we don't know. So, uh, like Keith was saying, the, the Maybe we wait until we figure out a way to, to check these things out without disturbing them, destroying them. Could be dust, could be bones, we don't know. So, does that answer the question? Yeah, thank you. Sure. I think I think that's it. I'm so happy you all came. There, um, one other last thing I wanted to mention um, that is coming up on Saturday. We also take outings and we like to combine our interests together. So on Saturday at three o'clock at Knock Knoll's Forest Preserve or Knock Knoll's Nature Center, which is 
in South Naperville on 95th Street. We are taking a hike with Janet Yang Rohr, who is a state senator from District 41, the Naperville area. She's actually my state senator also. She took Grant Worley's position. Um, so if you want to talk to her about something that's interesting to you at the state level or have some wonderful information shared with you by one of our outings guides about native plants, I hope you'll consider joining us. There's information on our website, on the events calendar. Can I make yeah, please. Yeah. I'd be really remiss if I'd be shot by the rest of my board if I didn't mention. Uh, the last Sunday uh, of this month, 26, we're having what we call Pioneer Day oh, yeah. over here at the museum between one and three o'clock. This year we've added on. One of the things we've been working at is we pretty good about doing our history in Glen Ellen back to 1834. We've been obviously now trying to push the clock back because you notice we've been here longer than 200 years. <laughs> so um, this year we are partnering with an organization called the Soaring Foundation. They're a Native American uh, intertribal group that actually started off by repatriating the burials. Uh, that's what they were doing. Now they do a bunch of cultural things as well. They've agreed to come out here and be part of our presentation. They're going to do a blessing and they're going to have dancers here and I believe a flute player. So if you want to see some of that culture, uh, come on out, be part of our Pioneer Day. It's appropriate that we've added that because they were still here back when this uh, Stasis Tavern was built. So we'd love to have you out for that. Good night. Thanks, everybody. Yay. Thank you.